Robert England here, a.k.a. Freddy Krueger. This is Burning for Springwood. Hello folks and welcome to, once again, Burning for Springwood. Uh, this is a Freddy's Nightmares retrospective. We haven't done one of these in a while, so I have to remind you guys of that. We keep, we keep it in our own rating system. I'll, I'll, I'll find that out when we get towards the end of this first episode. Uh, <laughs> I won't be around the bush too much around here, but uh, with us tonight is, uh, of course, Suzanne is here. How you doing? Greetings. Doing well. Cool, cool. Mike's here. How you doing? Doing well. Glad to be back in Springwood after, what, a few months, it seems like? Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> but, uh, we're just trying to make that better. <laughs> and out here sometimes, not all the time, but with us tonight, Mr. Venom is here. How you doing, sir? Greetings and salutations, Freddy fans. How the hell's everybody tonight? Fine, fine. He sounds overjoyed about doing these episodes, but yeah. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so, can you hear the excitement in my voice is so, it that obvious so excited yeah. yes a- a- anytime we can get a guest to return on this show i consider that a victory yeah <laughs> i ex- i expect my check in the mail mike <laughs> uh, I-, I think for this one though and i i don't want to tell tales out of school that they're-, they're actually pretty solid these two episodes and um why i get right into them Season 1, Episode 11, Do Dreams Bleed? Johnny's been having nightmares. I can handle a few bad dreams. They're real killers. Last night he got my pants. Could his sweet dreams be real? Just the way he's after me. Maybe he wants you because he thinks you saw him. It's a lullaby of murder. I hate cut rate competition. It's directed by Dwight Little, who I think... I think directed one of those Halloween sequels, four or five. I forget which one. I'm not going to go dive into that because they're both garbage anyway. Yeah, I'm going to guess it's one of the <laughs> shitty ones. Oh, man. Uh, premiered on James. Hey, that doesn't, that doesn't narrow it down very much. <laughs> yeah, that's it not the most uh, fluid franchise ever. But um, premiered January 7, 1989. Your plot synopsis is this. A man has dreams that depict information about a local killer, the Springwood Chopper. That's about, you know, the size of it, I guess. <laughs> I'm a, uh, those fucking dreams, man. I'll, I'll say one thing right off the bat. So fucking obvious who the killer was throughout this whole entire episode. But that's just me talking. I'm going to kick it to Mike first. Yeah, I mean, I would say if the... It, it, I felt the episode overall was decent, but the one big flaw is they make it painfully obvious who the Springwood Chopper is right from the beginning. As soon as, like, I think it's the principal, is it? or um, It's the coach. The coach. coach, that's right. Uh, he starts, like, you know, diving in with all these questions and, like, oh, but you, but you couldn't see his face, right? You, you had no idea who it actually is. Like, giving the, the, the game of 20 questions... It's like, why is he so concerned? Uh, gee, I, I wonder why. And, of course, uh, no surprise there by the time it all unfolds. But it, it did kind of have, like, a darkish ending, it, the way it wrapped up. Yeah. Um, so, you know, overall, I, I got some entertainment out of this one, I'll say. Did the shaft lean to the right or the left? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us, please, you know. <laughs> Uh, oh gosh uh Venom, what about you sir believe it or not i actually enjoyed this episode i i thought it was uh pretty entertaining though i have to admit that for the first say 10 minutes of the episode i thought they were saying the springwood shopper and i'm like <laughs> they're they're all pissed off about somebody who's like taking advantage of like you know crazy low prices <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it took me obviously once we actually saw the chopper in action i was like oh chopper okay i get it 
<laughs> Wait, you, you, mean, you mean these uh, high quality VHS rips weren't uh, exactly. <laughs> weren't useful I mean, even, and helpful? Even watching this in headphones, I had to crank it up before I realized they were saying chopper. But once once I caught it, then I started hearing it, and I'm like, okay, they are saying chopper. But yeah, um, not a terrible episode. Um, th this episode kind of falls into the same trap that a lot of anthology series fall into when they want to do a whodunit type episode. And the problem is, is that with episodic television, um, you know, either 30 or 60 minutes long, it's really hard to set up red herrings. And ultimately, in this episode, they only gave us two red herrings, basically the kid or the coach. Uh, and, and like Mike said, once they actually got to that, which was only probably 15 minutes into the episode where they get to that scene where the coach is kind of grilling him with questions – it, it's, you know, like Mike said, painfully obvious who the who the killer is. But the other thing that really struck me as odd is that uh, about halfway through the episode, once the kid actually gets arrested because they believe that he's the chopper, the very next scene is the coach in a cell with the kid. Who the fuck lets a football coach into a suspected murderer's cell to talk to him. He's not a family member. He's not his lawyer. He's his freaking coach. So obviously there's some suspension of disbelief here, but that completely took me out of the episode. And it's the kind of thing where if you didn't already know who the killer was by that point, I mean, the coach might've just, he might as well have just worn a t-shirt that said Springwood Chopper. <laughs> I just, they, they literally might as well have, but all in all, though, I did enjoy the episode. Um, you know, obviously, some of the dream sequences were a little over the top. Um, but, yeah, I thought I thought the performances were decent. Like, nobody's acting was so bad that it took me out of it. It, it was more story plot points that were kind of taking me out of it. But of the four or five, six or so episodes that I've watched so far, I actually have this pretty up there. Probably like my second or third favorite one. Granted, I haven't watched them all like you guys have, but yeah, uh, I for whatever it's worth, I enjoyed this one. Oh, well, not yet, Ben. We haven't watched them all yet. <laughs> well, up to this point, anyway. <laughs> yeah, I say, Mike already. Mike, Mike, what'd you think, sir? <laughs> oh yeah, I went first, but yeah, yeah I mean, pretty much. You forgot me. I forgot Suzanne. Yeah, I pretty I much forgot. echo Venom. Yeah, Suzanne, <laughs> go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh no, I'm 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 gonna kind of jump onto what V said, except A, they they pointed out that they did this under the radar and they just committed him. So no one knew that this poor kid was framed. Mm -hmm. And I just I hated I really I, I don't want to say I hated this episode, but two minutes in you knew exactly who the killer was. And I know I, I agree with, you know, episodic television. You can't really create that good whodunit atmosphere. Mm -hmm. But, oh, my God, this dude was so rapey looking. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, the fact that he kept like, you know, basically going at dude's girlfriend. Did he tell you anything? What did he see? What, what, what did he tell you? I'm like, come on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I will admit that the two acts kind of work together, which is a rarity in this show. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it was just, it was so projected from two minutes in. I just, I, I was kind of bored with it. I knew what was going to happen from the beginning. And you knew in the second act, the poor kid was going to go try to save his girlfriend, have, you know, the murder weapon in his hand when the police showed up. <laughs> It just, it was projected from the beginning. But I mean, some of the funnier tropes in this, you know, that the kid's parents are in fucking Milan. Oh my God, really? <laughs> you've, you, you've, you've subtracted parents from the equation. You've got this like rapey coach. And I, I'm, I'm going to guess he swung both ways because he was way too into this kid's personal life. But yeah, I this one. Say, I, I gotta say, is that a, like an upper middle class upbringing thing where like parents just take off on European trips? Because it's not like this yeah, is the yeah. first. I, I mean, obviously we've all seen this kind of thing in movies and TV shows before, but like I, for some reason, when I was watching this episode, it kind of struck me, and I, mean, I was like, man, I don't remember like any of my friends growing up where like I could see the yeah, parents no like you know, maybe going to the Bay Area for a weekend or something, but like. 
oh yeah, they just went on this, you know, European trip by themselves and I'm just kind of hanging out here for, I'm like, what, <laughs> what the hell? Oh, yeah. oh, please. The people I went to high school with, you know, they would, most parents would be terrified to leave their children overnight because of the massive party that would happen. And they didn't want their house destroyed. Mm-hmm. This was the class of people that I hung out with. So I just, that was, they had, they just had to like, they they overdid the whole terrible parents thing, but but uh, mom, I want you to come home and watch me play. Oh, it's okay. Well, coach is there watching over you. I mean, this thing was projected from the like I said, two minutes in. You knew mm-hmm. exactly how this entire episode, act one and two, were going to play out. And I'm just I just found it a little bit tedious and boring. Yeah. You got you got to admire the coach's long con. I'm going to go into this now because <laughs> he just <laughs> he keeps laying it in, and then up to the point where he convinces the parents to say, you know, we should keep this quiet. Let's 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 put him somewhere on our own. Like like you said, that's to make it believable that he's not like criminally insane, but he's in a mental facility. You know that that's you know was put there by his parents or whatnot. But still, like Venom said, who would let this coach in there? But then again. He's so embroiled in with the family that he's probably on the list or something to come and see him. And by the way, mm-hmm. have you been taking your medication? Do you remember anything? Like, no, I'm getting more and more loose because I'm not taking my medication. You know, and it's yeah, yeah. <laughs> and of course, the end. There's the he. Oh, by the way, he escaped, and there's two more deaths and yada yada yada. And this just lays out the trap to say, you know what? Yeah, now he's gonna try to save the girl and. Yeah, he's still supposedly the killer. Yeah, it ends just like you think it's gonna end. He gets, police break in, and he gets taken away. But <laughs> I just, I just love this coach's long con. He, he just like gets, gets, he, he's not, he's not a very efficient killer or anything. I mean, he, no. he, he believes that this kid is having premonitions. You know, remember what he is? Because it's never really said that if he's if he was an actual witness to a murder, you kind of think that he was, but they never actually say that. Because he keeps mm-hmm. having the same dream down the dark alley. And I will say one thing. The severed head looks pretty good. For, oh, for, yeah. yeah. That, I think that was one of the finer effects I've seen. I was about to say that because it, 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 the severed head commanded screen presence. It looked really good. I mean, there, there's, a, there's an effect later on. And, um, I think it's going to be on the next show, though, where there's a beating heart effect that looks pretty amazing. And... um. But yeah, that that looks really good. But I I I, I like it because it was so fucking laughable, very predictable. But goddamn, it was fucking funny that this coach was just doing all this shit. And see, by the way, I'm the killer. I, I almost wanted to hear like a comical, like um, oh, I'm trying to think what I'm looking for here, like almost like him running out the door, like maybe like he has like a kazoo in his head or a slide whistle, like. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, out, I'm out of here. I'm going to get away with it too, kid. You know? And, uh... I really want to see the version where it is the Springwood Shopper because mm-hmm. that would be so much more entertaining. You could put the seven, would... heads, seven heads in a shopping bag, maybe. I don't know. Just, uh... Yeah, that would have been way more entertaining for me. This one was just dull. Yeah, in general, the the writing in this one is pretty weak. I mean, in the in the very second scene where uh, our protagonist is talking to his girlfriend for the first time, he actually speaks the line, "I found the last victim." Remember? I'm like, really? Did your really? fucking girlfriend forget that you found a body? I mean, that was just the the it it was it was such a nasty piece of exposition that I wanted to reject it, but I know I I knew I couldn't because. <laughs> It obviously, you know, holds some weight to the story. So, but yeah, God, so awful. And then in the final scene, having the girl just hide behind her bed, not climb under it, not go into a closet, literally just hide behind it to the point that she's not hidden from anyone except the full view of what actually happens once they're first in a bed. I'm just. It, oh, I I thought that was such weak writing. It's like oh, yeah, because have, uh-huh. that mattress is going to save her from the axe. Of I, have a, I have a good answer. It's because she's it's white. It's Kevlar. Okay? It's Kevlar. She's white, so there's that. You know. <laughs> yeah, she's upper middle class white. white <laughs> Blonde white girl. Yeah, she's waiting, for, she's waiting yeah. for Doc Loomis to bust in the door and uh, shoot her boyfriend. You know that that'll. 
Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, if, if I can remember our rating system for this episode, um, I, I believe, you know, we uh, keep it in the boiler. Is um, what is what is our rating system, Michael? You know this, man. Uh, Dog Piss Resurrection That's, that's the worst. And w- welcome the worst to Primetime Bitch. Is yeah, the welcome best. to Primetime Bitch's tops. Or keep it in the boiler is middle of the road. Venom, what, what's your rating for this episode? Well, I mean, I can't say welcome to primetime, bitch. That that line should never, ever come anywhere near this episode. So this is definitely a keep it in the boiler. Like I said, for the most part, I enjoyed it, but I only enjoyed it based against the quality of every other episode of this series that I've seen so far. If I compare this to any other horror television show I've ever seen, it would absolutely be a flaming piss resurrection. But like I said, Based against the you know the few episodes that I've seen before, this is probably my second favorite next to the very first episode. So yeah, keep it in the boiler. Cool, Suzanne. I just found this tedious and boring. I did not like a single thing. The whole thing was so thoroughly projected from the first two lines of dialogue that this is like seriously straight up set this fucker on fire. Yeah. So, Flaming Piss Resurrection, then? Yes, it is. <laughs> oh, and actually, there was one other point that I wanted to make about this episode. This, aside from the very first episode of the series, this is the only episode where the second half wasn't drastically worse than the first half. So I got <laughs> credit for that, too. <laughs> I mean, the two did actually follow well. It was yeah, just there was, yeah, there, there was a cohesive narrative throughout the whole episode. So bravo for that, at least. But there wasn't a fat guy eating fried chicken and getting killed. So I, I don't know. <laughs> it's just, I need that in my life sometimes. But Mike, <laughs> what's what's your writing, Mike? You know, um, I guess we're gonna have some disagreements. I'm giving it a welcome to prime time, bitch. I know it sounds like that's being too kind, but. Uh, this is Freddy's nightmares after all. So when I get one that I actually like, I'm probably being a little too apologist about it, but on the scale of everything we've seen, this is definitely one of the better ones. Um, I, you know, I agree with everyone on the major flaw is that it was, you know, too on the nose from the beginning, but otherwise I found it to be pretty good. It was easy to follow, you know, it's one of the few episodes where the first half and the second half actually kind of blend together well, as opposed to like everything gets flipped at the 30 minute mark to you don't know what the hell's going on anymore. So this had all the elements of a better episode in the series. So I'm going to be the nice guy, I guess, and say, welcome to prime time. Bitch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we, we covered yeah, every possible. You say. <laughs> I appreciate you saying that because it the only thing that it had going for it was it was cohesive yeah. throughout Act One and Two. Mm-hmm. Other than that, it was fucking it was terrible to me. In most of these, that's really hard to ask for sometimes. <laughs> that's true. But um I'm with Mike I'm not up with Mike on that rating, but I think I'm in between um between uh keep it in the boiler and welcome to prime time bitch, but I gotta say keep it in the boiler. Because because of its very predict uh, pre- predictable elements right from the front right from jump, um, and but that's the real real flaw about it for me. Although I do I do enjoy the coach's swagger, he <laughs> just re- really selling this this concerned coach thing to to him and to to, to his whole his whole world. I, I kind of really like that. Although he is the killer, of course, and. He he got away with it too, despite those those meddling kids. And uh Oh my god. <laughs> but yeah, I gotta keep it in the boiler, man. But it, it's definitely watchable. Because just like Venom said, it's 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 a cohesive story from beginning to end. It's just not a very good one. It's it's just there, you know. But um this series that, that's hard to ask for sometimes in some of these episodes because they flip like 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 a fucking pancake in the second half sometimes and <laughs> but, yeah we'll talk about that uh, in the next episode um, which we'll go right into now it called uh, what's it called now the the end of the world I believe it is mm-hmm. the end of the world the end of the world. 
Amy's haunted by a bad dream. It was my fault. How did you find out? I dreamed it. A nightmare that could be real. The little girl in the car was me. Does she have the power to change the past? I can bring back my mother. Or will Freddy destroy her future? Accidents happen. This has a lot of good character actors in it. Um, George Lazenby, Andrew Prine, um, uh, some, some, some actor who looks like if, if Rod Steiger fucked George C. Scott, who's amazing. Uh, <laughs> I don't know the actor's name, but uh, that guy's amazing looking. Um, you also had a low rent Heather Graham wannabe. Yes, you did. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's premiered on January fourteenth, nineteen eighty nine. Your cheapo Wikipedia plot synopsis is a woman discovers she can change events that happened in her childhood, altering her life. Soon she dis- soon she is discovered by the CIA and they use it to prevent a nuclear disaster. Yeah, this is like the most bonkers episode that I've seen so far and it works so fucking goddamn good. Uh, Suzanne loves us a lot, this whole butterfly effect uh, episode, but uh, she'll tell us all about it right now. I just... This was, I think, the only episode that I can say that I truly love from beginning to end. There's a little bit of, there's a little wonkiness in between, but uh, this poor girl, her dad, you could tell he's like a major alcoholic because he's still mourning the loss of his wife that apparently his daughter had caused. And, you know, she starts having these dreams. But, of course, you have to have a dream. It's Freddy's (laughs) Nightmares. And she starts wishing everything back. Her friend was paralyzed. Now she's not paralyzed. Her scar was there. Her scar's not there anymore. And then her mom's there, and her dad died in a freak plane crash. I just want to know how she went from the butterfly effect to act two. And this is my only faux pas about this whole thing. She went from being able to change everything, kind of like the butterfly effect, to remote viewing. These are two completely different things. A weapon for the government, a a, a psychic witness. (laughs) (laughs) Like, oh my God, I'm I'm with you because you've got George Lazenby, who was like one of the first Bonds. So you, you have me at George Lazenby. I'm in. And then you have Andrew Prine. If you watched a horror movie in the 70s or 80s, you've seen Andrew Prine repeatedly and often. And I usually prefer that. And he's like this horrible, I mean, he just, he plays it to the gill. He really does. But that's what I love about him. This is just, it's it's a fun episode. And I, I, the two, the transition, like I said, I don't know how she goes from butterfly effect to remote viewing, but you know what? I just don't care because this is the one episode I really, really, really like. <laughs> so I'm going to leave it there. I'm sure I'll have more to say when it comes back around. Give me a nuclear code to dream on. Mike hit me, man, you know. <laughs> uh, this episode feels like it was like a it, it was left on the cutting floor of like amazing stories or twilight zone or a more serious show and then the freddy's nightmares team was like oh we can buy it up for cheap and somehow make it into one of ours because i actually thought this episode was okay but it it seemed like semi too serious for like the subject matter seems semi too serious for freddy's nightmares but you know, preventing nuclear disasters, CIA, all that, all those elements in episode of Freddy's Nightmares, I guess, can be entertaining. Um, yeah, I thought this episode, another one that was not bad. I mean, we've seen this kind of uh, gimmick done before, kind of like, you know, someone who has the power that can change events from the future or past in some way. And, of course, uh, I thought it was interesting how, you know, of course – uh, law enforcement or intelligence community gets a hold of her and like, oh, we need you to save the world. Um, but yeah, I, I thought this episode was was a decent enough one. I'll I'll leave it at there for now. Cool, uh, Mr. Venom. All right, I loved the first half of this episode. Um, and and kind of to go back to Mike's point about how it seems like. 
they maybe bought up an incomplete story for another sh- from another show. This literally feels like two episodes of like Night Gallery or Tales from the Dark Side that they literally just stitched together somehow because I mean really the only similarities that the first half and the second half have is our main star is you know our little blonde girl who you know uh, who is able to change, you know, events in the real world based on what she does in dreams in the second half. But then, you know, like Suzanne said, just is a casual observer for the second half of the episode. Um, the only thing that I can, and, and I might be giving the writing team a little bit too much credit, but the only thing that I could figure uh, with her kind of different abilities between the first act and the second act is that she was actually there for the events of the of the first series of dreams that she was having. She was there as a little girl, granted, but she was there. So I kind of figured, okay, maybe that's why they're giving her, you know, kind of the ability to make changes, if you will. Whereas the second half of the episode, she was never there. Um, I assume they were somewhere like at Langley or, you know, some CIA CIA headquarters somewhere. Come on, Shelby. Uh, Shelby. So so it seemed like uh, since she wasn't there in the real world ever... That's why she can't change events in the second in the, in that second series of dreams. Like I said, I might be giving the writing team a little bit too much credit, thinking that they're actually that savvy. But who knows? I'm I'm gonna go with that explanation. But yeah, man, the transition from the first episode to the second, I literally thought episode thirteen had started on. <laughs> like I literally thought episode twelve ended with the reveal of the dad dying in the plane crash and that I just didn't notice that like, you know, the, the, the streaming site we were, I was watching it on just went to the next episode because it's such a drastic change, both in atmosphere and tone. Um, and like I said, the only similarities are the girl. And I think occasionally Dr. Clark actually does show up in that second half, George Lazenby's character. So, I mean, he might be a little bit of glue to, that keeps those two halves together, but yeah, the transition was so jarring that unlike Suzanne, I did care. It, it was like I literally spent of the of the of the last 25 minutes of the episode, I spent a good 10, 15 minutes just wondering what the hell was going on. Like I, I wasn't even really taking in a whole lot of the story. I ended up having to watch the second half of the episode again. Because on the first watch, I'm, I was so confused. I was scratching my head. I was looking at IMDb to make sure I was still watching the right episode. <laughs> it was just so odd. Um, I agree with Suzanne that it's not necessarily a bad episode. Um, I can't say that I loved it beginning to end, but I thought that the first half... Um, Though kind of predictable, because we've seen that, and most recently we saw that storyline kind of played out in Happy Death Day to you. If anybody saw the sequel to Happy Death Day, uh, the main character in that movie kind of has the same moral choices, where she can make changes and bring back people that should be dead, and vice versa. Obviously, Happy Death Day did it you know, much more eloquently and believably. But um, I, I still, it, since it reminded me of that movie, which I did enjoy, not nearly as much as the first, but I, you know, I, I enjoy the characters from the Happy Death Day movies. And since it reminded me of it, you know, it kind of gave me a little bit of a warm, fuzzy feeling. So, yeah, this was another episode that I'm that I'm mostly positive for. Um, like I said, absolutely loved the first half. Um, didn't dislike the second half. I just, like I said, the transition was so jarring that it literally felt like two episodes stitched together. So, yeah, that's my general thoughts on that one. Yeah, but our blonde girl didn't have some kind of t- time loop machine in a science lab in this movie. Oh, God, thank God, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, our Heather Graham wannabe. Our low-rent yes. Heather Graham. Yeah. <laughs> I thought this episode was fucking bonkers. Let me tell you. Like I said, because of the whole butterfly effect thing in the first part of the episode, and I'm, I'm with Venom by saying, you, you wouldn't know what you're watching, you know, at the second part of the episode, if she didn't happen to happen to come upon some nuclear launch code in her dream. <laughs> because cause the, good, the good doctor brings up, you could even bring on the end of the world, end of the world, end of the world. <laughs> and and uh, she, she happens to dream up this this very real launch code which makes her a, a secret weapon to the CIA, you know, in the second half of this episode. But, but then they do, they do this thing 
to where you know, I thought I was watching the beginning of War Games or something. Because the, 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 um, there's this, this guy that, that the guy literally turns the key to make the nukes go off. He started going into his dreams and what's going on. and mm-hmm. The pressure of having to turn the key and yada, 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 yada. And who could give a flying fuck? But if I wasn't dealing with Andrew Prine and fucking weird Rod Steiger slash George C. Scott hybrid man. And, you know, <laughs> if I was to have all these characters and all, like, mixed together, you know, what are we gonna do with this girl? She knows too much people bullshit and yada, yada, yada. Yeah, but she's such an asset to the CIA, and yeah, it doesn't make any sense, but it's so batshit crazy. And then you get, you know, the great ending where Freddy's riding on a nuke like Doctor Strange at the end. Yeah, Doctor Doctor Strange, Fred. Doctor Strange, Fred. Yes. It's so, That's what this episode reminded me of. It is a beautiful capper to, to this fucking bonkers episode, and uh, you'd be surprised by my rating. I'm gonna give it that way, but uh. <laughs> uh but Venom, anything else? And what do you what do you rate the episode? Um, I. Uh, I had a lot of trouble just trying to figure out why the antagonist in the second half did what he did. Like, did they ever give us a clear explanation why this guy wanted to just launch nukes? I mean, it seems like he just woke up from a dream and just went to work and just decided, hey, you know what? I'm going to destroy the world. Cool. Well, I tried to rewrite it in my head as (laughs) he just had like some mental snap while his kids were sitting there being annoying as fuck. He's like, I'm going to kill everybody. Yes. I, can, I mean, I can understand wanting to kill your kids or your wife or whatever. I mean, I'm, I mean, we all have those moments where we don't think we can take it anymore, blah, blah, blah. But to, to want to destroy the entire planet because you're having a bad day, that is just, that's epically sociopathic. I just, I could not get over that. Um, so yeah, so like I said, um, the second half, I, I guess I had more of a problem with it than Suzanne, as far as the confusion as to what was going on. Why is this girl suddenly dreaming about, you know, the, these missile techs in, in, you know, in their bunker somewhere? It just, it, it just can't. And could you imagine watching this episode on television when it first aired? It's like you get the reveal of the first half of the dad passing away in the plane crash. Then you go to a commercial break. Then you come back, and it's almost like a whole other episode. I mean, that had to be even more confusing than us who were watching it straight through with no commercial breaks. So, you know, God bless anybody who sat through this episode on television back in 89. Uh, you're more of a trooper than I am. That's like, for sure. I remember this episode back in 1989. I watched it. Nice. So yeah, <laughs> it's like, come on, sucky bitch, you're going to Langley. Let's go. You know, <laughs> I just I couldn't get over that. Uh, just the <laughs> drastic left turn that it took. Um, not, you know, not the most over the top thing I've ever seen. Obviously, we've seen a lot worse in this series, even, but um, in horror series in general, you know, some odd transition and odd motivations, things like that. Um, as far as a rating goes, um, because of how much I loved the first half of this episode and thought that it was a solid, you know, first half, well written, well performed. Um, and then, you know, just the, the complete opposite of the second half. And like I've already said, the second half wasn't bad. Uh, once again, it wasn't poorly written. It wasn't poorly acted. It just the basic story structure just they, they lost me completely with that second half of that episode. So once again, I'm coming in middle of the road and saying, keep it in the boiler. Cool. Uh, Mike. Uh, yeah, I am going to go with that same rating. Keep it in the boiler. First half much better. I thought it was, you know, pretty cohesive to begin with. And then it just kind of gets more and more ridiculous as it goes like I said, it felt like it felt like it started out as maybe a more serious story for uh, for a non-low budget horror anthology show, and then they had to kind of quote unquote spruce it up for Freddy's Nightmares or spruce it down. Um, but you know, there were still enjoyable elements out of it, so I will go middle of the road and keep it in the boiler. Cool, Suzanne. Oh, this is straight up prime time, and I know. Some of my personal preferences 
are coming out because I love George Lazenby. I love Andrew Prine. Gary knows my how deep my love for Andrew Prine goes. I just enjoyed this one. And yeah, it is kind of when they went into commercial break and you come back. Sorry, I'm talking over the herd of elephants. <laughs> it, it was it was it was a complete mind fuck because that was you know my big thing watching it now in my adult head it it went from she can change things in dreams to she's remote viewing this dude who's about to go insane and I can I don't want to say I can't see that I just really enjoy the hell out of this episode it's for me it's everything I love I love the whole remote viewing. Thing thing I, re- I, I, I read way too much into you know just uh, I love my conspiracy theories so I love the whole remote viewing thing <laughs> so this just played into all of my personal things that I like and actors that I love so yeah this is pr- prime time I would recommend this to people I'm sorry my elephants are being very loud right now <laughs> uh, it's okay um. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm I'm with Suzanne, and it's really surprising that you know. It, I think it's just for the sheer bonkerness of this episode, because it is all over the place, but in all the right ways. I I think that I, I didn't I didn't mention this, but I think that her remote viewing, is, as Suzanne calls it, is for it's again somehow she gains another power, and she can see into this this um this this um nuke operator's brain and his dreams. And what he intends to do, because eventually he does, he does try to go for it and fails. But um, yeah, I I I like it. I'd recommend it too. These could all be found on DailyMotion.com with with uh, no ads uh, if you watch it on your computer at least. And um, oh man, that's gonna wrap this one up. But I'm gonna I'm gonna kick it to Venom first and ask him what he's got coming up. Oh, uh, well, let's see. Uh, the next thing we got coming up is um, uh, In the Mic of Madness, um, where Rebecca Reinhardt and myself are in the middle of our Friday the 13th retrospective. And on the next episode, which we'll record sometime next week, uh, Mike is going to be joining us where we'll be talking about Friday the 13th, Part 7, Jason. Oh, no, uh, The New Blood, excuse me. <laughs> I get my subtitles mixed up sometimes. Shame on me, I know. Um, so yeah, so that's in the Mike of Madness should be out sometime later next week on um, the next episode of No More Room in Hell, which is another show that uh, Mike and I are on together. We will be looking at a pair of classic 80s underwater horror movies, so that should be fun. Um, and we'll we'll probably, I'm sure, uh, a, a minor side discussion about the latest underwater horror movie that came out earlier this year, just called Underwater, will probably come up. That may have been the catalyst for this episode. Don't know. I'm sure Mike will tell us on that one, as these were his picks. And then on No More Room in Hell presents Fresh Cuts. Um, Our latest episode that released last week was for The Turning, which, of course, is the latest theatrical release, which is an adaptation of Henry James' novella, The Turn of the Screw, from 1898. And then... Oh, yeah. Uh, On the next episode, we are going to be looking at uh, Gretel and Hansel, uh, the Oz Perkins uh, grim fairy tale adaptation that came out last week. Uh, Mike and I have both watched that, and we're going to be recording that one tomorrow night, actually, with our friend Mr. Dave uh, Parker, or La Parka, as some people know him, the man who watches (laughs) way too many movies. And... um, Let's see, on the next episode of It's Not Horror, Okay, which of course is a movie commentary podcast, we're going to be looking at my pick, which is Canon Films' classic ninja film, Ninja 3, The Domination. Uh, This movie is an absolute turd, but it is a guilty pleasure of mine since the first time I saw it when it was brand new. Uh, For those who don't know, I absolutely loved ninja movies in the mid-80s, stuff like Enter the Ninja, Return of the Ninja, things like that. Most of those were starring Sho Kasugi, which he also stars in Ninja 3, The Domination. So look out for that one on the Horophilia Network. 
And then most of my other shows, unfortunately, are on hiatus right now. Um, the next one that will probably come back from hiatus will probably be Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, uh, which, of course, is my kaiju slash Japanese monsters podcast. We'll be looking at, uh, on the next episode, we'll be looking at Godzilla versus Space Godzilla. And, of course, we'll continue our retrospective of the original Ultraman series. And like I said, um, the rest of my podcasts are all kind of on an extended, uh, and that's it for me right now. Cool. Mike? Uh, can I just say ditto to like 70% of that? Maybe? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't want me to repeat all that. Venom handled it pretty well. Look for all that stuff coming up. Cool. Any, any word on uh, any more theme warriors? Uh, I am in the process. We are. I uh, last I talked, it sounds like we are ready to uh, try to schedule a latest episode. Um, I think we're sticking with the theme that we discussed way back um, before our hiatus began, which is American movies based on foreign TV shows. Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. It's a mouthful of a theme, but once you see the pixels, it all makes sense. So is the then you'll be able to there? trace them back. <laughs> no, nope. what's that? I said, "Is it oh. departed in there?" <laughs> oh no! <laughs> and no. <laughs> it is a favorite. But uh, yeah, other than that, I mean, I, I popped around on a few different. I've been on a handful of twenty-two shots over the last couple months. Um, and like uh, like Venom said, I'll be popping up on in the Mike and Madness. Um, but uh, yeah, I think other than that, Venom covered pretty much everything else. So I'm good. Cool. Suzanne. Suzanne. I know she got some writing bits coming up. I know for sure. But, uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, me and Suzanne can be found. And, um, on, on, on the, 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 the podcast and, uh, the TJ Venom commentaries. Uh, that can you hear me? Yes. I, what, what now? Okay, sorry. That's okay. I have no idea. That, that, um, oh, yeah, I might be taking my old writing gig back, so there are details in the future. I don't know because okay. I started writing off a few things, and I have lost my mojo. Uh, so... <laughs> Yes, I, you can find me on the NFW podcast with our your friend and mine, Nudie. Yeah, that and guy. Dennis and Jake. <laughs> and the tea drink minimum. I'm sure Gary's going to talk discuss that as we go. Yeah. And that's where you can find me. And I can also, hey, hit up your old Twitter account. I'm there, too. Yeah, the, next, uh, the next Cinevita should be coming out. Should be our Valentine's episode, which is going to do just discuss, discuss uh, Guinea Infidelity. We're going to do Moonstruck and Black Bellied Tarantula, so that should be a lot of fun. <laughs> I know they, they they do go together, people. I'm going to say about that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, next two drink items, I, I have two in the, in the can. I have to get out. Uh, had a lot of fun with Howling too, <laughs> and we had a lot of fun uh, hearing Willis bitch about Grease too. So you know it's um. It was a good time for, for both of those, believe it or not. And uh, <laughs> Hey, but me and my friend Katie were outside screaming cool rider at the top of our lungs. <laughs> How many did you have at that point, Sue? Oh, it, it was just uh, one of those nights where I had to blow off a little steam. Because <laughs> if you ever want to know what Suzanne wants on a guy, she wants he wants hell on wheels with hell in his eyes, you know. Come on, oh, wait, man. I married that, though. Yeah, you did. See, it's a good job. See? Yeah, I did. I seriously, <laughs> I totally got the hookup. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. The cool, 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 cool rider. Um, but, yeah, those all can be found at legionpodcast.com, um, along with the sloppy second segments uh, intermixed in with uh, the cinema beef with one court psyops. We have to record more of those, so <laughs> more of that's coming soon, too. And um, that's about it for me. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. And remember, always keep it in the boiler room. Have a good sleep. Have a good sleep. Have a good sleep.